I mean, at least I know who this movie's directed by. Steven Spielberg, as my, <laughs> my joke on Twitter yesterday. Steven Spielberg directing The Fun House, also released as Carnival of Terror. Jesus Christ, good Lord. You know, sometimes, Mark, I, I, I don't question why we watch things, but when we're talking about something like this, I am at a loss for words. <laughs> well, it kind of sounds like maybe you liked it even less than I did. Well... Maybe. We'll see. So on this episode of the Culture Cast, I'm joined by my good friend, Mr. Mark Begley of the Wake Up Heavy podcast. Hello. I forgot to gather up a clever line from the film to you. <laughs> just, sc- just scream. <laughs> God. And on, this, <laughs> and on this episode of the, well, that, that goes to show the quality <laughs> of this movie. Uh, on this episode of the Culture Cast, we're going to be talking about randomly for whatever reason, because why not? We like talking about movies. You can't muzzle us. Hashtag don't muzzle white man's opinions on movies, especially horror (laughs) movies. There aren't enough of them out in the world. Uh, We're going to be talking about 1981's The Fun House. Who will dare to face the challenge of the fun house? Who is mad enough to enter that world of darkness? Something is alive in the funhouse. Something not alive like its father. Something better dead. Something that has the form of a human, but not the face. This better be good. It's gonna be great. Something that feeds off the flesh and blood of young innocents. Come on, here we go. This is it. Something that tonight will turn the funhouse into a carnival of terror. The Fun House Coming soon from Universal Pictures, The Fun House. It's a carnival of terror from Toby Hooper, the director who terrified you with the Texas Chainsaw Massacre. So The Fun House is, like I mentioned, written by Larry Block, directed by Toby Hooper, and it stars, well, it stars a lot of people. Uh, Elizabeth Barrage, Cooper Huckabee, Miles Chapin, who I saw earlier this year in Bless the Beast and Children, hmm. of, of all things. Uh, and it is a movie about four friends who go to a carnival that has a fun house that maybe bad things have been happening in. And by maybe, I mean, some people got murdered <laughs> in the fun house and they're not supposed to go there. And they do. And wouldn't you know it? Wouldn't you know it, Mark? There's a monster. History repeats itself. Yes. Wouldn't you know it? History repeats itself. And there is a monster. And boy, boy, isn't there. <laughs> This is going to be interesting. <laughs> so, Mark, tell me about the first time you saw Toby Hooper's The Fun House. I, it had to have been within the last, well, gosh, now that it's 2022, sometime within the last eight years, probably. I saw it for the first time. This was not a movie I rented when I was young. I remember the, the video cover, and it's kind of cool, so I don't know why I avoided it. Which video it. cover? The one with the clown coming out of the jacket yeah, box? the one with the clown, and I'm sure at some point they probably had one that said from the director of Poltergeist, because this came out just the year prior, and the video for it probably came out when Poltergeist was in theaters. Or came out, came it, out the year prior, feels like it came out a decade early. Yes, it does. That was one of the, one of the points Christ. I was going to make. It feels like a 70s film. Uh, in early, tone and early and 70s tone and um, well tone yeah but I watched it I didn't care for it the first time I watched it and then I watched it a second time sometime within the last four or five years and I feel like I enjoyed it more that time and watching it yesterday I went back more to the first time I watched it and thought, yeah, I'm not really sure I like this one that much. I had never seen this before. I can't say I'm a fan of Toby Hooper's work because that would be all of two things other than this 
One of those things, I guess three things, but one of them is technically the second film in a series of those films. Uh, those films being Texas Chainsaw 1, Texas Chainsaw 2, and Poltergeist, this being now the fourth Toby Hooper film that I have seen. And yeah, no, I'm with you. This movie is not good. This movie has a lot of problems. This movie, this movie is 96 minutes and it feels like it's two hours. The climax of the film goes on for it. It, it, it almost if, if I if I didn't know any better, I would think that this was a parody film, a satire. Like it pushes on that at times, especially mm-hmm. with the way the film ends, where it takes literally him being crushed to death to die. The, he being Gunther Tweebent, the is that the name of the character? Yeah, Gunther. They never say <laughs> his name, but that's that. what Wikipedia and IMDb say. But my God, what a character design by Rick Baker. <laughs> by Rick, well, I mean, it looks like a Rick Baker character. <laughs> it looks like it looks like a hairless. You know what it looks like? Because I know you're a fan of this movie. It looks like a hairless version of the creatures from American Werewolf in London. You know, the little Nazi werewolves that break yeah, into the yeah. house. It looks just like those. That's true. I that, hadn't like, even made that connection. Because the thing. Yeah, they don't show his face a whole lot. But <laughs> Unfortunately, it's the funniest thing in this movie. That That's a very good point. You yeah. know, I was your comment. Also done about, by Rick Baker, by the way. Right, obviously. right. Your comment about the tobe hooper that i always say tobe i don't know why i know you're the only one who does i kind of like toby it. hooper tobe I, I don't know maybe i heard somebody say it that way famed once. auteur tobe yeah. hooper. <laughs> but i'm if looking through made his... movies like not like this movie he might have been called tobe hooper well if so for me i've seen quite a bit more texas chainsaw massacre i've seen eaten alive salem's lot the tv series this Poltergeist, obviously. I can't remember if I've seen Venom. Life Force, Invaders from Mars, Texas Chainsaw 2, which I am not a fan of. Right, which is weird. And- <laughs> well, it's weird. Well, it's weird because you're you and I sync up on a lot of our opinions on things. And that is, I think, it's weird because that is a film that is, I think, widely regarded as a good movie. Oh, yeah. A lot of people love it. it it's that horror comedy mix right. that, that which I, I don't totally get. I, you are like the most averse to that of anyone I know, which is why I completely like I completely get it. And it's it's because of movies like of Texas Chainsaw 2, I feel like it's it's not so much horror comedy. I think when they're taking the piss, mm. that's what it feels like to me with this like, oh, I've got free reign and I'm going to I don't remember when this came up. It it it's the same thing with Gremlins 2. Oh, wait, do you not like Gremlins too? I feel like they're making fun of the people who like the original. And that is my, that's what I take from it. I'm not saying that that's, I mean, you could you could argue that with Gremlins too, because they're taking all of those, not just the errors, but the whole, the whole myth of the Gremlin and kind of right. saying, this is all the stuff you like. Well, fuck you. It's all stupid. And we're just going to go crazy. And that's sort of how I feel Texas Chainsaw 2 is as well. That's just me. You don't like Gremlins 2? No. Oh, my God. (laughs) I don't know, man. That's that's a harder. That's a hill. See, for me, that's a hill worth dying on. I don't know. For me, I love that movie. Like, again, a lot of people do. A lot of people like that more than the first one. And it's that it's that tone. I I, you know what I, I you know what's. You know what I will say? I think comparing Gremlins one, like, why are we even comparing them? Why? You know what I mean? Like Texas Chainsaw Massacre 2 is a different movie than the first. Oh, yeah. So much so that it's like it's like like we should be viewing Gremlin Gremlins and Gremlins 2. I I wish it had been Gremlin and Gremlins. That's what (laughs) it would be now. Um, We should be viewing Gremlins and Gremlins 2 and Texas Chainsaw and Texas Chainsaw 2 like Alien and Aliens. They're completely different movies. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Like tonally, like Terminator 1 and Terminator 2. Terminator 2 is not scary. Terminator 1 is pretty goddamn scary. And Aliens is not scary. Alien 1 is a a horror movie. I don't mind that switch. It's just that horror comedy thing doesn't generally work for me. It seem i mean i talk about this a lot on my show and it's come up i think in other 
things that I've done. I say that, but there are a number that I really enjoy, but it's a hard, it's a harder sell for me if it's going to be a mix of those two. So what, what of those kinds of movies do you like? If we're on something like topic. Tucker and Dale versus evil. Okay. Um, that's a good one. Kind of a, I'm that's trying to more think of popular now than it used to be that movie. There's a, uh, there were a, a couple of more recent, like, like the Shaun babysitter, the Dead, right? Shaun of the dead. I enjoy a lot. That's kind of like the pinnacle, right? And that's almost straight comedy to me. I mean, I, I like Shaun the, of the dead, but for me, it, it has diminished in its value since it came out. Like I loved it when I first saw it. But now it's like, it's good, but I like The World's End better. I like Hot Fuzz better. I think Shaun of the Dead's a good movie. I just, it's not my favorite of those anymore, but it's still a huh. good movie. Yeah, I I don't know. I don't, <laughs> it's really a tone thing. And sometimes the tone works for me and sometimes it doesn't. I enjoy humor in horror and there is almost always humor in, especially 80s horror. There's always right, going right. to be um, a character that supplies the humor or, humorous scenes but often when, fat characters when it's yeah when it's just when it's that's what you're doing i don't know it just it doesn't work for me very often how do you and think that's not really the, like dead alive yeah dead alive or even you know bad taste uh which i love i haven't seen dead alive in a very long time but the that's frighteners the frighteners i do not like for not that su- exact reason not surprising because I think the humor in that kills the horror when it, when it, when that happens to me. And again, it's particular to me. I'm not saying that someone else will watch Texas Chainsaw Massacre two and think, Oh, the humor is killing the horror for me. For me, it does for other people. It might not same with gremlins too. Although that's, I mean, I think it's a stretch calling that horror anyway. Well, the first movie is a horror movie. First movie is a horror movie and it works effectively as a horror movie. And there is humor in the movie as well. Right. But it's dark humor, uh, which I prefer as opposed to slapsticky Hulk, or Hulk Hogan. comedy. <laughs> I mean, and I, say that, dudes. <laughs> I say that knowing that Tucker and Dale versus evil contains a lot of slapsticky horror. But, humor. but, but that's, but that's the point of that movie. Right. That movie's um, not, that movie is not one bit scary. Right. 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 I think it's uh, when it's trying to be scary and funny where it's the problem. You can have a horror movie that's just a comedy where horrible things are happening and people are getting chopped up and bitten by zombies and shit. But don't try to be scary. It's kind of like, hard to do uh, both. You mentioned American World War from London and I Hilarious don't see, movie. I don't see that as a horror comedy film. I see it as a horror film that has elements of humor in it. Surreal, are, a lot of surrealist comedy and like absurdist comedy in that movie. Yeah, yeah, and, and character. Yeah, obviously, Jack. Every time he shows up, it's funny, but it's also yeah. fucked I mean, up. It's not horrifying, but it's <laughs> but it's fucked up. It's gross, and yeah. it's and it works. It treads that line perfectly. Griffin Dunn. That's the first movie I ever saw Griffin Dunn in. I, I watched some reaction videos of that a couple, like last year or deep, deep in the pandemic when there wasn't much else going on. And I was watching all these reaction videos and people were very thrown off by the tone of American werewolf of London. And I've never questioned it. It, it weaves in and out, you know, easily and perfectly to me. I mean, even Rosemary's baby, if we're going to, there's humor in that, the, 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 um, you know, the Elisha cook junior character and, and obviously uh, Ruth Gordon and her husband are goofy and it, it's humorous, but that's not, it's not a mixture of those two. Right. I love good humor in horror, but anyway, we've gotten way off the track. Well, well, is there well, any humor in the fun no. house? <laughs> well, I was going to say, you like good humor in horror, which brings us to this movie. <laughs> oh, I know what I was saying. I was going through uh, Tobey's filmography. <laughs> and the, I think the old, the, the mangler, is another one that I've seen. Most of those movies like Invaders from Mars and some of those have that and Eaten Alive have this really strange tone that I think this fits into where it's not really even humor. It's just a weird, a weird feeling. I think he just had a different kind of sensibility about right. things. And that's a Which I would agree. I would agree with in this one. It's like you mentioned, this does not feel like an 80s movie, you know, 81, even that's early 80s. But still, when you look at other slashers or horror 
movies from 1981, you know, you know, you're in the eighties. This is like, I don't know what this is, man. Slightly exploitation y seventies, yeah. early seventies. That's what I'm saying. Feeling. It doesn't even feel like late seventies, early eighties. It feels like like 71, 72. It's a weird movie. When you turn this movie on, you will be surprised by what this movie looks like. Like what this movie is from essentially frame one is strange. It's weird from frame one because fucking it, it's a psycho slash Halloween homage for. Oh, yeah, totally. No, I don't strange. think I noticed that the first two times I'd watch it. I'm like, oh, this is Halloween. Puts a mask on. It's point of view of the killer walking through a room, puts on a mask, picks up, picks up a knife, sees his sister's breasts, <laughs> which is super. OK, yeah, we- <laughs> oh, uh, we we're out. opening this movie yeah with this which is this little boy seeing his sister's full-on perky breasts and it's just like whatever here we go folks it's like i was confused from the first frame i i do like the credits though of the film that was i actually watched it with my daughter i said i gotta go home and and watch a movie for tomorrow you can watch it with me if you want and she's like okay so we were watching the credits and we're both going, okay, these animatronic figures are creepy as hell. Yeah. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. <laughs> and I liked the music too, but um, yeah, then the opening, I thought, okay, Halloween. And of course the shower, they do a close up of her face, which is basically the Jamie Lee Curtis scream. Mm-hmm. So we've got Halloween and psycho paying homage or ripping off those two classics and then going in an entirely different direction after that. <laughs> yeah. In a in a direction that I don't I don't understand what Toby Hooper was going for with this movie, because it, it again, I, you open it with what I assume is uh, homage slash parody slash re- your own kind of sensibilities in that scene, which is perfectly fine. But then the rest of the movie is just they go to a carnival and then they're in a fun house. The rest of the movie, a fun house that is like acres big. It, I, it, it, it's it should be an interesting I was pe- cons- I, my interest was peaked by the premise and it is does not even remotely deliver you could do a lot inside of a fun house right isn't that kind do a of lot a- inside of Leatherface's house in Texas Chainsaw yeah a movie and that all- Tobey made <laughs> and then the whole subplot with the brother so she's she's a teenager she's like a junior or senior in high school or something and her brother i think it's mentioned that he's 10 or something like that and so she's going to go to the carnival with her new boyfriend and a couple of his friends it seems like they don't know her or like her very well that's the impression i got but the brother sneaks out after she has left to go to the carnival as well and it leads nowhere Right. I couldn't remember well enough because I probably half paid attention the two times that I watched it. And I assumed, okay, he's going to get, he's going to be the device that frees them or saves them at some point, or, or he's going to uh, be in peril as well. Right. And that doesn't end up being the case at all. Nope. He sneaks around the carnival looking for her for God knows how long. And then once the car, once the carnival shuts down, he's still sneaking around, but there's not a whole heck of a lot he can do because everybody's left and the car is still there, but he has no idea where they are. And then he just gets caught by one of the other carnies and they call his parents and they come and pick him up. And it's, yeah. I guess it's solely for the scene towards the end where she is screaming through the fan, our heroine, our final girl, where she's screaming through the fan that her parents who are there right. and obviously they can't hear her. So yeah. that was all the setup for that shot. I that's I, I, that's I don't what know. it seems like. Cause they devoted an awful large amount of time to, to our good, our good friend, the brother of the film. Yeah. I don't understand. Again, if you're, if you're going to spend ostensibly a third of the movie on the B plot, it goes nowhere. Yeah, there's no payoff. I don't get it. And Sean Carson as the brother is not bad. He's yeah. not given anything to do. I like when the old hick scares him in the truck. That was hey. enjoyable. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I like that. But but I'm thinking there's 
there's an there's an easier way to get her parents and i mean it doesn't even need that scene really there's an easier way to get her parents there they didn't want her to go to the carnival they somehow find out she's gone donnie could come down the stairs and go you know they're not going to a movie they're going to the carnival and then have the parents go there and try and find her and get her ass home because she disobeyed the dad blah blah blah. you know there there were other ways to do it it I would have liked something to have happened to Donnie. I think that was the brother's name to where he was in peril and she had to save him as well as herself. Right. But it didn't make it, any sense to me why that wasn't in there. Yeah. It doesn't, think. it doesn't pay off at all. No. Well, and it's, you know, what's, what's even stranger about the movie is if you know what this movie's existence consisted of, which is it's a Friday the 13th ripoff. It feels like one. It's yeah, written except- by Larry Block to cash in on Friday the 13th's popularity. It just feels like a poorly done Friday the 13th ripoff. Except there's no, well, yeah, you have a masked killer. Yeah, who looks weird. Who's a mutation, which I guess is the different angle here. Right. He's a sideshow of, creature. It's, it's not really a stock and slash situation. It's more of... It reminds me of, I don't know, every time I watch this, I th- I think of a couple different X-Files episodes, like obviously the Carney one. Right. And even something like um, the one that's all about Cher, the, the creature that likes Cher. Mm. It makes me think of that one, too. They were because of the, the home episode. Well, and home kind of in a way as well because of the mutation. But what is that one called? It's Prometheus something. I don't know if it's modern, uh, the modern age Prometheus man or something like that. Yeah. Yeah. So it it makes me think of those three episodes of the X-Files and how much I'd rather be watching any of those three episodes of the X-Files. Yeah. I, I, what I, I guess what I don't understand about this movie is why does it spin its wheels for so long? It takes so long for it to get to the point where they're being chased by Gunther. And when, you know, uh, Conrad, the, the the carnival barker is uh played by kevin conway he's he's chasing after him too but he's also kind of mobilized gunther into being a a killer for whatever reason right and i that stuff is all a little muddied for me as well like yeah because i assumed that he set up the tryst between the sylvia miles character the the madam vena and gunther to to, you know, the most uncomfortable scene in the movie when she is going to um, have sex with him for money. Right, right. And I figured, oh, the dad set this up because, you know, they're all they're all a part of this thing. And this is the only way this kid kid, I say kid, is ever going to have sexual relations. That's man. I don't remember that scene being that weird before. She basically jerks him off. And I was like, oh, my God, I never noticed that's what was going on. <laughs> God, I like, oh, okay. Luckily, my daughter wasn't really paying attention to the movie <laughs> at that point. I was like, I don't think she understands what's going on right now. <laughs> the monster, the monster's having a good time before he makes everybody else have a really bad time. Is what's yeah, and I was like, oh, this is yucky. And and then of course, because of of his uh, premature ejaculation, he gets angry and kills her and. That's what sets everything off, along with that jackass stealing their money. Miles Chapin. Yeah. He was yeah. in something I saw recently, too, and I couldn't remember what it was, but I recognized his face. But he, he's pretty good. I really hated the boyfriend, though. Buzz? Oh. Was that his name? Buzz. Yeah, he's... Typical asshole. Yeah. I'll go I'll go stop him. You go. I think we know what's happening. But just even before that, about. how he was how he was treating her the whole time. It just kind of made me angry. Yeah. He's one of those characters where you're, you're excited to watch him die. You know, he's going to get it. So you're like waiting for the moment for him to get it. And he gets it off screen. God damn it. That's right. (laughs) Don't don't get, don't not give us that. Don't give us, don't not give us him getting murdered. There's very little gore in this movie. I was confused by that. I thought, did he, what's who's, which one is screaming? Because it seemed like he had the upper hand, but mm-hmm. guess then not. He comes out in the arms of one of the animatronic figures. Yeah, yeah. I do like Elizabeth Barrage, though. Yeah, she's not bad. I liked her in this, and and every time 
I see her, which isn't very often. I'm like, what do I know her from? I, I know her face so clearly. And then I realize, oh, I watched Amadeus a bunch when I was younger. It seemed like it was always on cable or we rented it a bunch or something because I watched that movie a ton in the 80s. And she plays his wife in that. And she's Never hysterical it. in it. She's very good in that movie. It's, it's on my list of things to watch. It is. I just remember being so confused by the whole thing, thinking, oh, you know, it's about Mozart. It's going to be this serious movie. And it's just him being a goofball the whole movie <laughs> until he gets yeah. sick and dies. It's so uh, I forget the actor's name, but it's Pinto from Animal House. Right? Yeah. Tom Hulse or yeah. Hulsey or something. I think it's Hulse, but Pinto from Animal House and whatever his character's name is in Parenthood. Yeah. He was, he was kind of big for a little while. Yeah. Mainly because a, of Amadeus. I said, that's a big movie. That's a popular movie. Milos Foreman, right? Yeah. Which is probably why it has that interesting comical. Uh, I mean, I'm sure that's how the play is too, but um, yeah, I remember watching that a bunch, just getting a kick out of that film. Is it, does it speak to this, the quality of this movie that we would rather talk about anything else than this movie? <laughs> it's just, I, I, I genuinely don't understand the point of this movie because for all of the nuance that Toby Hooper brings to Texas Chainsaw, which there is a fair amount of nuance to that film. It's like, this is a student film. Like this is as, this is as bad as it gets for these kinds of movies in a lot of ways. Like this is really a poor slasher film. There's not, I shouldn't say there's not much to it, but like you've mentioned, not a whole lot takes place. Right. During, I mean, we've got, these little side adventures where they go and see a magician and they go and to peek through the, the canvas to see the strippers, but it's feels like padding to me uh, as, as opposed to the meat of the story. When we finally get to that, it just seems like it could have been, yes, we still have those things in it, but it's much quicker. And then we get to the fun house, they get trapped in the fun house and just, and a lot more cat and mouse. There isn't that much of that. And the adding that the person that's doing this is, is a quote unquote circus freak and not even a circus freak really. Cause he's hidden most of the film in a gigantic Frankenstein mask. Comically, comically large, comically <laughs> large Frankenstein mask because the head of the creature is comically large. Right. Basically split in half like the two headed cow that they show. That was a bit unnerving. The the real animal freaks. Yeah. I don't know what the deal with that was. <laughs> it's like, oh. <laughs> I just I I just really can't I'm having a hard time wrapping my head around this movie. Because in a lot of ways, like I, when I got to the end of it, I was like, okay, so all the characters but our main character dies. Perfectly fine. It's a horror movie. The brother is not involved in the climax at all, but given a third of the movie. And what what like what was the point of all of this though? Like, be careful what you wish for. Don't go places you shouldn't go. You yeah, know, horror, don't go horror places movies you tend to have go. some something to say, and this movie didn't have anything to say. Yeah, I think it's don't go places you shouldn't go. That's the through line. Dad says he doesn't want her going to the carnival, right? Because two girls had been killed in some other city, right? At the okay. same carnival, they go. Yeah, and also they go into the ride when it's shutting down. So you're not supposed to go there. They see things they're not supposed to see. They go into a room, steal money. Uh, they're doing a bunch of stuff that they're not supposed to do. It's not. So how are they the heroes of the movie is what I'm getting. Yeah, right. Well, that's the thing. My point is like, that's, what is it? What's the point of this movie? Cause the good guys seem like bad guys. They seem like the villains of the movie. Well, that's what everybody says they're doing in Texas Chainsaw Massacre as well. You know, we've talked about that before and how I disagree with that notion. But yeah, I guess it is it a morality tale? Kids these days, kids these days, kids, that's the Gunther. <laughs> My favorite part of the whole movie is when um, Conrad is like, go, go, go get him. Hit yourself or I'll hit you. And he pulls that mask off. I laughed out loud at the reveal. <laughs> okay. Okay. That's the thing we kind of still haven't talked about. The monster, while it's a good design, is a fucking dumb design. It looks really dumb. Like, it looks 
like laughably bad. Like not like bad quality, but like what they're presenting on screen is not scary. It is hilarious to look at. Well, I for me, it's confusing because I and I guess it probably would be a harder sell if it was more of a realistic deformity because he they looks like a monster. They, they, yeah, he, he is a monster. That's why I was saying like it looks hilarious because he's not he doesn't even resemble a human being. Like this is this is beyond what I would consider a realistic level of like mutation that someone could live as. Like, how is this person actually? I'm not like cinema sensing or anything, but like, how is how are you actually alive? Everything <laughs> wrong with the funhouse in everything 15 is, minutes. Everything is wrong <laughs> with it. But like, how are you alive? I think it would be a lot more disturbing if it was a realistic deformity, but they right. maybe didn't want to go that route because it's insensitive but you could i think you could do it right with the right tone right and i have agree. someone because uh, obviously someone with a, a severe facial deformity would especially in this that at that time be ostracized right of course makes and, perfect sense at the time i understand like but why to have it be a monster it's basically a monster it's a monster it's not is, like it's kind of my daughter's eyes just like went round as saucers when he pulled his mask off. It's the funniest part of the movie. It's funny. Like, it's hilarious. The reveal is insane. He and is a monster with he's a dude in a monster mask is what it yeah, is. Yeah, you kind of lose sympathy for the character at that point, or at least I feel like I do. Like, oh, it's it's a he's a monster. Right. Like a, a literal the monster. The nuance, the nuance from the character is gone the moment the Frankenstein mask comes off. Yeah. There was a slight level of nuance to the character beforehand. Like you said, you kind of feel sorry for him with the whole Madame Zena thing. I mean, he kills her, but you kind of feel bad for him because he's ostracized. He's not being treated very well by Conrad. But then, yeah, right. he's yeah. just a literal monster <laughs> who who, die, who has to who has to be killed like a monster. It takes like eight million things to kill him. Right. Yeah, it's it's plays into the worst tropes of this genre. It just plays into every single trope you could imagine. It feels a little bit like his film Eaten Alive, which was the film after Texas Chainsaw. It has that strange tone. That's a that's a trippy movie. You should watch it sometime. It probably won't top your Toby Hooper list of films either, but it's Have you seen Motel Hell? Uh-uh. Okay, it's similar to that. I mean, it's similar to Texas Chainsaw. It's people getting trapped in a, you know, like a hotel or something in the swamp, but it's all set bound. It's it. Nothing is on location. It was just a set that's created. So it's got this weird Jalo-esque lighting. There's lots of greens and reds. And so it has this interesting look to it. And, but again, it's just, there's something about his sensibilities and tone that, doesn't quite work for me that I can see people hooking on to like, Oh, this is the Toby Hooper touch, you know? And like, just like for the reasons that I like something like tourist trap, which is again, similar to all these films, it's young kids in their twenties going where they shouldn't go. Right. And getting stalked by a creepy person in a mask. I mean, that's, it's, that's Texas chainsaw. Well, it's also tourist trap, right. Which I enjoy 10 times more than, Texas Chainsaw, even the original, which I really like, but I can see people watching that movie and going, oh, this is weird. This has a weird tone. This doesn't make any sense. And that's how I feel about a lot of Toby Hooper's movies. Even something like Life Force has an off. There's just something off about them to me that doesn't quite hit my pleasure receptors the same way or something. I don't know what it is. I can't ex really explain what's missing from his movies. But something is missing. And I something's agree, definitely I agree missing. Yeah, something's definitely missing in this one. Well, and again, this isn't Toby Hooper's script. So I wonder, wonder what the script is missing. Because again, this, you know, Toby Hooper can't do much with a bad script. You know, that is kind of the, you know, I think I, Texas Chainsaw Massacre is probably Toby Hooper's best film in a lot of ways. It's also one of like three films that he wrote himself. So maybe that lends credence to why it is the case. I know he worked with Dan O'Bannon on two of the movies you're talking about. Life Force and Invaders from Mars are both Dan O'Bannon stories, yeah, which piques well. my interest because I'm <laughs> I'm a huge Dan O'Bannon fan. Yeah, I'm, that's a whole other can of worms for me. What, Dan O'Bannon? 
Yeah. He there's yeah. a lot of st- there's a lot of stuff of his I like and then and there and there is a lot of stuff I don't and it's kind of for the same reasons that they're those kids they're the ones that grew up on EC comics and things like that that had a real real black humor and but I I think it's just how they translate it um Dan O'Bannon plus Dan O'Bannon's just a weird everything I've practically everything I think except maybe for the Hodorowski Dune uh, documentary he comes off as the you know and I know he was sick and in a lot of pain for a lot of his life but he comes off as this curmudgeonly um, man who every time you know with every script he wrote he seemed to be so angry at the changes that were made, you know, like alien, my script was so much better. I mean, he, to be fair, he, they did try to take alien away from Ron Shusett and Dan O'Bannon. Right. And then Tyler well, and Hill tried to take it away completely. That's maybe the only one where I give him if a you're pass. A, everything if, else. Right. I, I agree with you. But if you're a script writer and you haven't gotten to the point in your life where you realize that these things, once the script is sold and out of your hands, it's like you, you need to learn how to say goodbye. Right. I agree. Because tons of people are going to get their hands in on this. So for me, it's one of my favorite movies is Dead and Buried. One of my earliest episodes I did on that movie. I used to watch it all the time. It's a Dan O'Bannon, Ronald Shissett script. Dan O'Bannon wanted his name removed because, you know, they he he said that they changed it so much that sure. basically none of what he wrote was was in there. Uh, that didn't happen. But it, it's just I every time I read a story about something he was involved with, he's pissed off that they changed something. He's pissed off that this came out differently. Um, yeah, he's been involved in a lot of things that I really like. And I always wonder to myself, well, how much of it was his? Because it seems like, according to him, everything's been changed to where it doesn't even resemble what he wrote. But let's talk about something <laughs> Return of the Living Dead, my favorite zombie movie. See, written and, and, and directed by Dan right. Bannon. And it's, it's, I have grown to enjoy it more, but it would never even enter like a top 20 list for me. Really? And again, it's because of that. I think that does a, more successful job of mixing comedy and horror because the horror is still strong and and there's also a lot of pathos and drama and stuff in that i mean the scenes with um what's his name with the two guys that are running the place you know oh yeah yeah, yeah. um when they start turning tom matthews and james karen yeah it's like heartbreaking you know it is it's it's fucked up <laughs> it's james done karen very well burns himself alive yeah that's rough, pretty fucked man. up it's very <laughs> fucked up but that's what i that's what i like about that movie yeah, is it I, it, it, it has the it. balls to be like yeah, I'm going to show you some really fucked up stuff, but also show you some really funny stuff. Like I have a backpack um, somewhere in my house that has a pin that is the half dog from yeah. uh, Return of the <laughs> Living Dead. It's a half dog pin that Mondo was selling a couple like a year or two ago. And it's like that. It's an enamel pin of the half dog. Like I, I fucking love that movie, but I understand that that movie has problems and that movie is a tonal mess. But yeah, yeah it is. <laughs> and, and sometimes even tonal messes work. Right. For me, like, well, that was a hard shift, you know, but I kind of like that sometimes. Um, well, you've obviously seen that documentary then, More Brains. Mm-hmm. So, you know, you know, you know, you know about yeah. Dan O'Bannon. Yeah. I mean, again, I, here's the, he was my, a nutball. My, my take on Dan O'Bannon <laughs> is you're not wrong. You're completely right. He was a curmudgeon guy, but you know what? I kind of would be too if they tried to take Alien away from me. Wouldn't you like what? Alien? Like Alien I, is one of the greatest movies ever made. They knew what they knew what they were making when they were making it. Like you know what I like. It's one of those things where they knew what they were making. They knew they had this great idea. Two motherfuckers came in. Walter Hill's a motherfucker, but he's a motherfucker who's talented. David Geiler can piss up a fucking rope for all I care. But they tried to take it away from him. I mean, they did. That is th- that is the long and short of it. And w- and if you didn't have your name on Alien and someone else did, you'd be pretty fucking pissed too. Yeah, but I agree. but I agree with you outside of that. Like, dude, you got to be able to like 
collaborate, compromise, work with people. You can't be the guy who everybody thinks is that guy because then people won't work with you because they think you're that guy. Whether yeah. or not you are that guy, if you have that perception, people are going to stay away from you. Well, and who I think knows I what he didn't be, work on because of it? I'd be angry too just because I have Crohn's that, you know, well, it's destroying my guts. <laughs> well, that's, I mean, that's, a, a, again, as someone who suffers from a similar intestinal thing, not as bad as Crohn's, but similarly as kind of daily, I understand that kind of pissiness too, yeah, because you're yeah. like, you, you can't see the sickness that I'm dealing with. Cause it's like, it's a stomach thing. So it's like, I'm kind of pissy all the time too, but I get it. But at the same time, you don't want the perception as someone who's hard to no. work with, especially not in Hollywood. Not when you're selling scripts. Yeah. Not when you're not, you're not Johnny Depp, you're Dan O'Bannon. Like right. you need to be careful about kind of how far you flex your muscles about your self-importance, I guess. I don't know. Yeah, that I think the self-importance is the thing that always kind of uh, yeah. rears its head when I see stuff about him. I, Which I, like I, I said, I, though, also I, get. I really like a lot of the stuff that he's been involved in. And he he should be celebrated because he had his fingers in a lot of different interesting properties over the years, whether much of what he wrote ended up on the screen or not, you know, and uh, that's why I'd be real curious to find out what exactly of his was in Dead and Buried because I fucking love that movie. I have never seen that movie all the way through. Yeah, it's a it's a weird one. It's it's a it's a weird movie, but it it caught my attention as a kid and and I still watch it. I see its problems now more these days, but and it was it was going to be a a horror comedy film. They wanted to film it as a black comedy. Well, I shouldn't say horror comedy, but as a black comedy. And I'm kind of glad they didn't. But it would be interesting to see that. That may be what Dan O'Bannon was pissed off about in that instance. So Larry Block is an interesting guy, apparently. (laughs) Yeah, I've seen the name on things, but I'm not super familiar. He's one of the writers on the Captain America movie. Oh. Uh, But his singular credits are The Fun House. And Captain America, along with the Me Gunther Horror Show, which you can find on YouTube, which is, I assume, Larry Block as Gunther in a Gunther mask as the character from Funhouse reviewing other people's movies. One of them, one of them happens to be Dan O'Bannon's Return of the Living Dead. Oh, you know, but, you know who I'm thinking of? I'm not thinking of Larry Block. I'm thinking of the guy that wrote Psycho. <laughs> it's not even spelled the same way. Robert. Robert, Robert Block? Block. Yeah. B-L-O-C-H. Yeah. yeah. Well, I will tell you that I understand why there have not been a whole lot of things out uh, from Larry Block since this movie. (laughs) Yeah, I'm. uh... it's not a narratively interesting film. I honestly think the problems with this movie are, I mean, outside of, you know, honestly, I think it's the, the script. What have we complained about? What have we talked about, analyzed with this movie that hasn't really just boiled down to the plot? Yeah, no, I agree. I think it's it's a little too it's padded for one thing oh my god the whole brother stuff is right that out cut that out completely and you've lost 20 minutes now you're sub hour 30 and that's the thing that i kept going what okay what i couldn't remember what happens with the kid he's got to get captured by the creature at some point no that never happens and then he he never even interacts with him right and i yeah that's why i was like well that seemed really pointless then other than that shot of her screaming through the fan, right. which you could have her do at anybody in the carnival mm-hmm. that was right. still there. I mean, there were obviously other carnies still breaking down the carnival at that point right. to get, you know, to get out of there and get to the next town. Yeah. I don't know. It's, it's the premise I, on paper sounds better than it is an execution. You could have so much stuff go on in a carnival. That's, yeah. I mean, that is, well, just think of the word you, when you hear the word carnival, you think of all kinds of exciting stuff, rides, sideshows, but it is called the fun house, right? But which is what I mean, people who like this where, movie will say. Yeah. But where but, do you find fun houses? <laughs> but I would also contend 
that while it is called the fun house, like you've mentioned, you shouldn't expect that there aren't going to be carnival parts because I assumed there would be as you did. And also I assumed they would do more with the fun house. They would make the fun house more interesting, more interesting to look at. It looks so drab and boring anyways. It's not like- interesting. It's not even like Gothic or really stylized. It's just, I really like that big eyeball though. At the beginning, I thought that was a pretty well-made thing. <laughs> No, it's, I don't know. It's another one of those movies that I know has its audience and you just kind of wonder, what is it? Not to second guess anybody's taste, but it's like, I wonder what it is that people latch on to with this. Elizabeth Burge's boobs, which you get to see a handful of times in the film. I don't know. The creature design, I guess. I don't know. Well, Larry Block is also one of those guys that doesn't, uh, let me put it this way. If I had reached out to Larry Block to interview him for the show, he probably would have will- done it willingly, even if we have a bad opinion about them. He's one of those kinds of people. I mean, he that's will- fair. Yeah. Hey, you know what? Good on him for getting a movie made. It's a Toby Hooper movie. Great. Outside of Toby. that. Toby. <laughs> Outside of that, everything else, there are better movies that are like this. That's the problem, honestly, isn't it? Like any more, like you've got to justify your existence to me and then justify me wanting to watch you again. If you want to see a good carnival movie, watch Malatesta's Carnival of Terror with Hervé Villachez. Uh, it's fucking weird. See, I'd watch Really that. low budget. It's one of those regional films that just has a weird, weird feel about it. <laughs> I'm a huge fan of Tattoo so, and Fantasy He's, Island. I probably got the name wrong. Or right. No, that's that's his name. No, no, no. Mal- I know it's Malatest. Yeah. Oh, Malatesta's Carnival of Blood. Sorry, not Carnival. Wow. Made in 1973, which is what this movie feels like. Right. It was made in. <laughs> uh, and you know what? I really wonder if this movie had been made earlier and leaned into some of those things more, if it would have been a better movie. Yeah, it probably would have been a little bit more interesting. Grime yeah. it up, like grime it up a little bit. Right. Do something like do something, please, because they didn't do anything. It's not slick because Poltergeist is a pretty slick movie. This movie is not, but it's also not grimy and it's not uh, filled with atmosphere because you've decided to make it like a carnival in the middle of nowhere. Like it's still a nice carnival. There are people there. That's the thing that I have a hard time with this movie. It's like the carnival and the fun house. There are plenty of people there. It must not be dissuading them that people have died. So it must not have been that big of a deal. <laughs> Fucking we William watched. Finley is there. I know. And, and, and not used effectively. One scene. And, and it's not a, and it's. It's nothing to write home about. It's a shame that it's William Finley that we have to mention that it's William Finley. Frankly, that's, it's a shame that it's him more than anything else. It's a fun little scene, but it could have been tightened up yeah. and edited a little bit cleaner. This is seven know, we, years after Phantom of the Paradise, too, which cracks me up. We watched uh, It Chapter 2 after this and, you know, that carnival scene in that. Yeah. It's like, oh, we got another carnival that doesn't really do much with the carnival <laughs> scene scenario. But anyway. Carnival scene in It Chapter 2 is rough. Yeah. Well. You're talking about the opening of the movie, right? No. The, well, there's two carnival scenes, I guess, actually, since there's one in... in yeah, no, the one with the kid when um, Bill is trying to save that kid. Oh, right. I forgot about that. Honestly, I forgot about it. Most of mostly everything from that movie. I haven't watched it yet. <laughs> I'm not looking forward to it. It's three hours long. I know. And I have to hear that fucking Pennywise noise like eight million times. I, I, had, I had to watch it yesterday because I there wasn't going to be any way I could do it today or tomorrow. So. You don't hear that in the movie. You hear it all the time. No, it's in the trailer. It doesn't matter. It's in the movie in my head. <laughs> they ruined that movie with those noise cues, anyways. Uh, you know that. Oh, we'll talk about that. Yeah, we fucking will. <laughs> yeah, we will. Because <laughs> that's one of my big, big problems with that movie. <laughs> that's that's my biggest problem with those movies. Well, that's my problem with horror in general, and the. Uh, now era the tens the twenties yeah 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 yeah. make more movies like funhouse just kidding don't (laughs) 
I get I, uh, this I movie know. came out on <laughs> this movie came out on Arrow. Like we're wrong here. You know what I yeah. mean? No, I know like, it has we're, fans. We're fucking wrong. Like we're we're big time wrong. Oh, excuse me. It was a Shout Factory, Scream Factory release. So of course it was. Of course and, it was. Uh, you know, I I always I always say to each their own. Right. And I know I have very particular tastes even when it comes to horror and i know that this has a fan base it just doesn't it's just not it's and it's not something that i would never watch it for some reason my daughter was like remember that movie we watched that one day with the and it would take me a while to think of what she was talking about <laughs> right. and then i'd go oh you mean the fun oh yeah can we watch that again sure why not i'd you know i'd watch it again for if she brought it up or for someone else asked me to be on a podcast about it i guess but so, probably not for any other reasons. So did you hear kind of the weird part about the novelization of the book of the movie? I read that. Yeah. That Dean Koontz under a pseudonym right. had written a novelization, fleshed out the backstories of the, I mean, well, the, I mean, that's what you do with a novelization and that it came out prior to the movie coming out because it was held up. And so people thought it was a blah, blah, blah. And the brother is throughout the movie version, the book version of the movie. He is involved in the climax of the book. The younger uh, brother is right. So I, I don't know what happened then, because whatever, if, if it's if if Dean Koontz's book is better, it might be because Dean Koontz did a good job or because they carved up Larry Block's script. True. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know which one, but there is a version of the story where the brother Joey and Amy end up together in the basement of the fun house and they fight Gunther and kill him down there. That and, makes well, way more right. sense. Right. And like <laughs> that movie, I that movie, that's the movie I was expecting. That's, that's the movie that the book apparently is. That Im sounds immediately more interesting. Right. And that's what I kept thinking. Like, oh, she's going to have, he's going to get captured first or he's going to be down there first. And they end up, you know, finding each other inside of the, the fun house at some point and, and getting out together, not, Oh, some other carny found me, laid me in his bed until my parents got there. And then I went home right? without, I guess, without him mentioning what's her name's here. Still, they don't, the parents don't know. They think she's gone to the, to her friend's house to spend the night. He doesn't tell the parents their car, she actually came here and their car is still here. I saw right, the car right. and tried to get into it. Why wouldn't, why wouldn't he tell them that? It's weird. It's, it's weird. The movie is like, it lacks logic, which makes me think it's not entirely Larry Block's fault. Yeah. Maybe there, maybe this script did get cut up big time. Hey, that, that makes sense. That's where that yeah. was leading and it didn't, and it didn't go there. And on Scribd right now for $15 a month, you can get access to all kinds of audiobooks. So this is not an ad, but Fun House is on there. Eight, out, eight hours. That's it. Huh. Hey, hey, might be good. I don't know. I mean, if, if I read it and I come back to you and I say, hey, that movie is not as good as that book, that's a problem <laughs> because I don't know. The book sounds a lot more interesting than the movie. And Dean Koontz is a good horror writer. I mean, he's like the only other one most people know other than Stephen King, which always cracks me up when you go to the used bookstores and you look in the horror section. K, everything else is unimportant. <laughs> Literally like King and, K, Koontz. King and Koontz, baby, and nothing else. Yeah, I, I tried my hand at some Koontz back in the day. I read his Frankenstein book that he did because he did like a three part Frankenstein series like in New Orleans. And I read the first one. It was pretty good, but I've never read any of his other stuff. I don't know any Dean Koontz, anything. I read fan. I, I'd have to look. I saw phantoms in my chest where I keep my old books when I was looking for Sounds of the Lambs. And I saw phantoms and I know I read a couple others as well. He didn't hook me in like Stephen King did. But um, yeah, I enjoyed couple of his books pretty interesting ideas to quote uh <laughs> to quote jason muse affleck you the bomb and phantoms yo that's <laughs> the only thing i know about phantoms is that fucking line from jan <laughs> Bob strike back never seen that what is that's that what is that movie about that's the second time you've brought that up what in as many episodes that I've recorded with you you also brought up jay and silent bob on the my own private idaho episode <laughs> 
Oh yeah. The applesauce bitch thing. Hey, <laughs> <laughs> that's Miramax man. in like the nineties and the early two thousands. I mean, Goodwill hunting was like their fucking their calling card for like a decade, man. And rightfully so. It's yeah. A very, it's a very fine movie. Yeah. No, I'm kind of curious. Actually, I might go and find a Dean Koontz book and read it. Like, I've never read any of his stuff. So I would be curious to know, like, what his best book is and go and read that. Because what are his books about? Like, I genuinely have no idea. Because, like, this is not what I thought a Dean Koontz book would be. But yet that's apparently what Funhouse is. So it's a Dean Koontz adaptation of a Larry Block script. So... Maybe it's good. Right. Maybe I'll read. Hey. Maybe that'll be the Dean Koontz. Let me know. Let me know what you find out. I'll read yeah. it after I finish Silence of the Lambs, yeah. which will not be much longer because I'm already halfway through. <laughs> it's a good book, man. Fucking great book. It's not as good as the Funhouse film, but you know. <laughs> so, uh, oh, and, the, and the movie is just awful. Yeah, right. <laughs> it made one and never, never heard anything else ever. <laughs> Hannibal Lecter, who's that? Uh, Mr. Begley, final thoughts on uh, on the Fun House, a film that neither one of us picked. By the way, I think I'd like to. Yeah, I, I was wondering why this. Why came did up. we talk about this? Dude? I don't know. It just it was one of those things that popped up in my email. You have an invitation to. Oh right, it was Andy's idea. Well, and he's not even here. That little <laughs> fucker, son of a bitch. Well, well hey. it would have been interesting if he had had a differing opinion on this since he picked it. He probably likes it. Big dummy. <laughs> Listen here, we eviscerated this fucking movie. Sorry, <laughs> we didn't like it. Yeah, it's an it's an oddity. It doesn't really fit in with the films that I think of when I think of horror in 1981. So maybe check it out as an oddity. It's a curiosity. Yeah, and and like we've mentioned, you know, it came out. Although I don't know when it was filmed, since obviously there were delays in getting it released came out the year before Toby Hooper's biggest, at least box office smash. I would, I would say it's his biggest movie, right? Texas Chainsaw is the more like horror fan movie, but I think Poltergeist is the more culturally important movie. It's definitely his most successful film. Yeah. I can't imagine that there's that Texas Chainsaw, even after all these years has come close to making as much money as Poltergeist did. I like the uh, theatrical poster for Funhouse, the ripoff of the Rocky Horror Picture Show poster. That movie that they were making with that poster should have been whatever this was, and it wasn't as fun. It was a, this is a, like you said, this is a strange mix of things. It's a movie out of time. It's a movie out of place. It's a movie that exists post Friday the 13th, pre Poltergeist. So nobody's taking Toby Hooper seriously. Because he's the guy who made Texas Chainsaw. He's not the guy who's made Poltergeist yet. So this movie comes out to I, I again. You read the reviews. You know at, it's middle of the road. People said it's you know at the time people were saying it was okay. Nobody was like this is a great you know amazing film. But like you said, it it is it. Thankfully, it has like a lot of things found its audience now, and that is what I am thankful for as someone who loves movies. But didn't like this one. I'm glad this movie does have an audience of people who clearly like it a lot because they have like a Kim Newman film critique in the Blu-ray re-release from Scream Factory. It's a whole fucking mm. thing. So I'm glad that there are plenty of people that like this movie and that are willing to watch it and that it's found the audience. Yours truly and my good friend here, Mr. Mark Begley. That is definitely not the case for the two of us. Yeah, not not my favorite. No. So on that note, Mr. Begley, where could people find you when you're not here talking to me about random horror movies that we'll never watch again? You can find me on the internet at wakeupheavy.com, on Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, and Letterboxd at Wake Up Heavy. And uh, the show streams wherever you listen to podcasts. That's about it. <laughs> As for me, cstachy.com, C-S-T-A-C-H-I-W.com. That's my link tree. Go there for all the things I work on. There are a lot. Um, yeah, go there. This show, culturecast.com, patreon.com slash culturecast. Dollar is all it takes to get access to bonus content. But I understand. Times are hard. Inflation's a thing. This all sucks. Movies are fun, though. They're an escape. So if you want to escape, all you got to do is listen. 
and you know maybe watch along if you're feeling froggy uh as for you mr begley thank you for joining me as always i guess yeah, kind, of a, kind, of a, kind of a dud kind of a bummer but hey we got to hang out and talk about it you got to listen so make sure to check out the next episode <laughs>